Hi, everyone. I'm Erica Henning, and I'm a partner at Apex One Investment Partners. We're a real estate investment firm based in Houston, and we invest in multifamily real estate, primarily in the workforce housing sector. And I'm thrilled to moderate this panel today on reshaping our communities. Is that me? Sorry. Um, because throughout my career, I've had the opportunity to work on some of these types of projects. Nothing nearly as grand as what you're going to hear about today, um, but it's just interesting to me personally um, to hear about projects that are making big positive changes in their respective communities. So the structure of the uh, panel today will be um, with uh, first Sid Kitson from Kitson and Partners and then Tim Johnson from Strategic Property Partners, giving a five, 10 minute overview of their projects. And then we'll have a conversation and it'll be focused on three main areas. First, the vision. Um, second, execution. And then third, lessons learned along the way. So before we get started, I had to put in a Disney slide since we are in Orlando. Um, and it's a small world. So I remember when I was a student in graduate school, always hearing from alums, it's a small world. You never know who you're going to run into. You know, real estate is such a, a small knit community. So I'm going to show that's true. So that picture was taken about a year ago when I was a guest judge at an MBA real estate case competition. And the gentleman sitting next to me is uh, James Noser, who is the president of Strategic Property Partners. Um, you know, the firm that's responsible for Water Street, Tampa. And so that was the first time I heard about this project. And um, I have to tell you, I thought it was so cool. So when I heard that was one of the projects we were talking about today, um, it was, you know, even more exciting to me. So with that, I'll kick it off to, um, to Sid. Oops. Oh, Sid. One more. There you go. Well, no. That was weird. There we go. There we go. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate sure. it very much. So um, I had the, uh, believe it or not, I had the opportunity to play a little football. Um, I was actually a water boy for Green Bay for about five years, as you can, as you can, as you can tell. And I, I thought it was interesting to see Mickey Howard's comments about Tom Brady. You know, Tom Brady, if, if he had come up to me and said, hi, I'm Tom Brady, that would have been kind of cool. But if he said, hey, I'm Tom Brady, I want you to meet my wife, Giselle, that would have been something. There, it's, that's a teammate. So, so Kitson and Partners, uh, we do master plan communities. Uh, we started up in the Northeast, uh, then uh, came down to Florida in 1995, uh, and, and now uh, develop uh, pretty much uh, throughout the state, both on the master plan community and uh, retail side. But we're here to, to, I'm here to talk about Babcock Ranch. And uh, when, we, when we first conceived Babcock Ranch, we wanted to create the most environmentally responsible, the most sustainable new town that's ever been developed in the country. And as you can see, it's in southwest Florida. It's just 15 minutes from downtown Fort Myers. It's about 20, 25 minutes to RSW. Yeah, it's Fort Myers International Airport and about another uh, 15, 20 minutes to uh, Port Charlotte Airport. So it's, it's, a, it's a good location and something that, uh, that we're excited about in, in moving forward. So here's what we did. We bought 91,000 acres. That's 143 square miles on an area five times the size of the island of Manhattan. And then we turned around and we sold 73,000 of those acres to the state of Florida and the largest land purchase in the history of the state. And so then with the remaining, we, that, by the way, that was a transaction of $350 million. And then after that, uh, we had 18,000 acres remaining. And out of the 18,000 acres, we're preserving half of that. So at the end of the day, 90% of the original ranch is in preservation forever. And that was our number one priority. How can we preserve as much of this land as possible and keep up the stewardship that the Babcock family had put into place. So why, why, was the, uh, why, why was the state so interested? Well, they wanted to complete a wildlife corridor from Lake Okeechobee all the way to the Charlotte Harbor estuary. And that's exactly what was accomplished here, as you can see, uh, when they purchased uh, that uh, preservation land at Babcock Ranch. So 
we had, uh, we had one year to effectuate the sale of that land to the state, and, uh, and then we had uh, that same year to get entitlements for 19,500 homes and, and six million square feet of uh, commercial space. We had one year to do that. Now, for everybody sitting in this room, you know that normally it takes about 10 years to get done. So we had a lot of people who worked closely with us to get that done, and, and sure enough, here we are today, fully entitled uh, for, um, and permitted, uh, for 19,500 homes and 6 million square feet, parked uh, about 80% in Charlotte County and about 20% in, uh, in Lee County. This is, these are the building blocks of, of, what we, of what we wanted to, and actually, that is actually not the, uh, it's close. Um, we had seven initiatives <laughs> that, we, that we put together that really are the key to what we wanted to do at Babcock Ranch, and each one of these we spent an enormous amount of time digging into them, spending, I mean, we took years. So we closed on Babcock Ranch in 2006. Perfect timing, July 31st, 2006. And, and, and the only thing that saved us was that government is so slow to work that we didn't put anything in the ground, because I can assure you, if we had started with our infrastructure, I wouldn't be standing in front of you here today. But we spent a ton of time on these initiatives, and, and, and we got them right. And, to, and we wanted to make them a reality. One thing I assure all of you is that you hear so much about smart cities around this country and people talking about it. You hear about it you know, from an academic perspective. There are very few people actually stepping out and doing it. And we're very proud to say that we're actually taking the, uh, the risk and going out and making and truly creating a smart community. And in order to do that, you need partners. Something is big, and the big ideas that we had, we had to bring in a, a, a set of partners. And each one of the, of the groups here that you see have had a huge impact on what we've done at, uh, at Babcock Ranch. For us, it started with the environment. Everything we've done has been with the environment in place. 90% of our development area is on already disturbed lands, as an example. We have rain gardens throughout the community. We have a state-of-the-art water quality system. We limit the amount of turf that you're allowed to put in there. It has to be all native plant materials, and it goes on and on and on, but we're very, very proud of that. And one thing you're gonna find out is that, that our consumers, both the millennials and our empty nesters, all believe in it deeply. And that's been a big, big plus for us, something that, uh, that we're very happy about. In order to be a truly sustainable community, it starts with energy. And, and so we spent eight years trying to figure out how to make Babcock the first solar power town in America. And uh, we were very fortunate and to work with, finally, uh, working through the legislature and, uh, and teaming up with Florida Power and Light to uh, create uh, the first solar pow power town. So let me put this in perspective. Um, Florida Power and Light put 343,000 panels on 440 acres, and then they also covered all of our commercial buildings and they have solar trees. They're going to double that. They've decided to, make, to put in another 75 megawatts, make it 150 megawatts, and that all powers directly to our town. So the power goes from this location to Babcock Ranch, and then whatever's left over goes into the grid. The other thing that they've done is we've always wanted Babcock Ranch to be kind of a living laboratory. So the other thing they did was they, had, they installed the first solar to battery facility in the entire world. So there's 10, megawa 10 megawatts of battery storage uh, on the property. And it, it is very, very exciting because what could that lead to? Right now we're working with them for the possibility of a microgrid city. Right now uh, you know, we're trying to gather data. How long does it last? How long can, can we get through a night if there's a storm, if the electricity goes out, how much? Uh, can it actually power the town? So all that data is being collected right now. And the other thing they did there, you can see on, on the right, is they put in a tower so that uh, people can come and see it. Um, and it's been incredible. We have uh, tours there on the weekend, and then we bring uh, kids to come out and classes so they can really start to understand what solar power is about. And this has been, a, been an exciting uh, initiative uh, uh, for us. Health and wellness was, a, was probably one of the most important things that we that we really worked on uh, at Babcock. It has proven that you, if you live in a healthy environment, you're gonna live longer. So we teamed up with Lee Health. We built a 30,000 square foot uh, facility. And uh, Lee Health, it's, it's, it's not, it, there's obviously a gym, but it's much more than a gym. 
We have physical therapy, occupational therapy, preventative medicine. We have doctors uh, on staff full time there. And if you look down at the lower right uh, left hand corner, uh, those machines that you see there with the ellipticals, uh, the, the treadmills, the bicycles, they all put power back into the building. And it was actually the first equipment uh, that was uh, able to, to, to do that. And they're starting now to disperse it throughout the country. So when you're working there, you're actually powering the building and it tells you how much you did and uh, people start having competitions with and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. The, uh, also as part of a healthy community, you need to have trails. I, I think you've heard millennials and uh, empty nesters love trail systems. So every neighborhood will be, have access to a trailhead and, and, a, and a trail system. Uh, we're gonna have 51 miles uh, that we're actually gonna finish. There's another, I think, 20 miles that are a little bit more wild that people can go out and at their own risk uh, go after. But when you go into our, our trail system, you, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a dock for fishing. Uh, we have uh, uh, dog parks uh, that you can walk to. So it's, it's really to get people outside and to uh, really uh, enjoy nature and have it very, very convenient for them uh, to do that. We also have community gardens. You can't believe the number of people who like to garden. And it's not just limited to, to empty nesters. So all the food and, 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 and uh, 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 other goods that we have at, uh, at uh, Babcock are all farm to table. Uh, and a lot of them come right from our own community. But our homeowners absolutely love this and have been, uh, been a big part of that. The, uh, this has been an interesting story for us. So um, Governor Bush, who's on our board, said, you need to start with a school. And uh, we said, but, but nobody's living here. He goes, doesn't matter, you gotta start with a school. If you, want, if you want to have a multi-generational community, you gotta have a great school. So we did. We built a school and, uh, and he was absolutely right. As a matter of fact, um, we were brilliant. Uh, we had a 150 seat, seat, six, uh, 156 seat school and we we're hoping that half of it would be occupied. This is how brilliant we are. We we're hoping half of it would be occupied. Well, when we announced that we had this public charter school that was opening up, 100% of the seats were taken immediately. That's great. It, it's, it's breaking even. We don't have a deficit. We have no seats for Babcock Ranch students. So we had a huge problem here, one of those big lessons learned. And, uh, and so we had to build another school. And this is actually the new school, and this is 500 seats, and it's really been a huge success. It's project-based learning and STEAM, and it was, in its first year it had an A rating. Very, very proud of that. Technology was extremely important. We, we uh, teamed up with CenturyLink. We teamed up with CenturyLink to have um, a gigabit and fiber to every single home and business. You can actually get up to five gigs. So that's part of your package when you move into, into Babcock Ranch. You have a gig and fiber to your home. We're also uh, creating something we're calling the key. And that's going to interconnect everything within the community. That's in development right now. It's very tricky. It's very difficult. I'm not in the, uh, uh, the tech business. We're real estate developers, and we're learning a lot about how difficult this is. But we're hoping to roll that out uh, uh, this year. And then uh, self-driving cars. Uh, we started this six, maybe seven years ago. Uh, when we really started to investigate you know, what, what this meant, we worked with the Earth Institute at Columbia University. 30 to 40,000 people a year die on our roads. 1.2 million people die worldwide on the roads. That's absolutely outrageous. It's outrageous that we haven't done something about this. But obviously the implications of autonomous vehicles run deep and we know that. So over a year ago, uh, we've, we've had uh, uh, an autonomous shuttle system in place. We teamed up with TransDev, the largest transportation company in the entire world. So if you go to Babcock right now, you can actually take a driverless shuttle around the community. We want to be at the forefront. And this year, what we're hoping to do is get point to point, where you'll be able to get on your, your smartphone, order the uh, car up, it'll come pick you up and take, where, uh, take you wherever you want to go to. We think this is going to be a huge disruptor, as and you've, you've all been hearing about it for a long time. We're actually doing it. We want to see how it works. We're getting great data, too, uh, uh, from that. And then finally, storm safety. Um, you know, we have an opportunity to do something special there. Babcock Ranch is 30 feet above sea level. Here in Florida, that's a virtual mountain, as close <laughs> as we are to the, to the coast. 
So, you know, we had, we had Hurricane Irma come right over the top of us, 130 plus mile an hour winds, and we did very, very well. We had very little damage. Here's what's interesting. Not one, not one of those solar panels was dislodged, and it got pretty rough up there. So what's nice about this is our homeowners can actually uh, stay, they, they can uh, uh, sit out the storm uh, in, in place and not have to evacuate. And I, I think that's very, very important, something that, uh, that we think gives us a little bit of an edge. Founders, so what we did a little bit differently here at Babcock Ranch, this is a town. There's no gates. It's anybody can come in, and that's really important. So instead of coming up and just building this big uh, uh, clubhouse that maybe or may, may or may not be used, that everybody has to pay for, we built an authentic town, a real town. That, uh, and, and we created uses here that would uh, that create excitement, body heat, and having people come in and out. So right now, today, literally several thousands of people come in every single week in and out of Babcock Ranch. So when you go there, it's a vibrant community uh, that uh, really creates a lot of excitement with, uh, with that uh, kind of traffic. So what we have is a, an outfitter store where you can come in and, and rent bicycles or, or uh, hiking equipment or go out into our, our lakes. We have a restaurant. We are surprised. I, by the way, being in the restaurant business is awful. Is anybody in the restaurant business? That's right, because you all are making money, because it is an awful business. Um, but we do have a restaurant. It's somewhat of an amenity for us, but uh, it's actually been a lot more successful than we thought it was going to be. We have what we call the hatchery. It's, uh, it's like a WeWork site. It's an incubator. You can see it on Millennial actually designed that. And, uh, and it's been hugely successful for us. Uh, all the spaces is, is rented out. We have a, uh, a, a general store we call it Slayer's Goods and Provisions. Uh, cool place, again, where people can come in and, and shop and, have the, and get the essentials that they need right now. The good news is, is that we have a major grocer that we're just signing up uh, right now that's going to be moving in uh, uh, within, a, within a year. We're excited about that. And then uh, we have Square Scoops, which is our ice cream store, which everybody loves, probably me more than anybody else. Uh, and then finally, our pre-K uh, daycare. When we talk to our homeowners, and, and again, we want to be multi-generational, and the schools allowed us to do that. About 50% of the people buying homes at Babcock Ranch are young people with kids. And the other 50% are the typical empty nesters, you know, you know retirees. Um, but what the young people said is, look, we need, we need preschool. We need, uh, we need daycare. And uh, so we got Bloom Academy, Academy to come in, and uh, it was incredible how fast that filled up, and that's been very successful for us uh, also. The other thing we have is we own and operate uh, our own utility. We built uh, the county country utility. We have reuse water that goes throughout the community. And we have our own waste management called Ecologic. I'm from New Jersey. It was just a natural for me. I feel pretty good about it. I've, uh, I knew a lot of guys who were in this business, so uh, they told me they're going to take that business from me, which I'm going to give them. Uh, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's been uh, it, just ha controlling these utilities has been has been fantastic for us, uh, and we've been able to uh, really get out in front of uh, of what we need to do here. So that's a little bit about Babcock Ranch, and I look forward to uh, talking uh, a little bit more about it as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, I guess we're standing. I know whatever you want to do. Um, so first of all, I just want to say uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to UF and definitely taught me a lot. Um, so I want to thank everyone for having me here today. We're gonna, I'm Tim Johnson with SPP, Strategic Property Partners. I'm the CFO. The unique thing that I have the honor of, of actually worked on both these projects. I used to work with Sid and Kitson for 10 years. Um, it was one of the hardest decisions to move. But there was a little project in downtown Tampa that drew me away. So SPP is developing Water Street Tampa. It's a mixed use, um, well, back up. Everyone asks who is SPP. It's a joint venture between Cascade Investments and Jeff Vinnick. Jeff Vinnick is the owner of Tampa Bay Lightning. Um, he's also in the hedge fund business. To do this, I'll come back to that. So we're in downtown Tampa. We own and control 54 acres right on the water. Surrounding the arena, and we're planning to build a little mixed-use community. Um, the stats you see 
on the page here are for full build out. The map, there's two, the light blue is phase one, the darker medium blue is phase two. Our phase one is over five million square feet. We're trying to come out of the ground with it right now. We have three buildings coming out of the ground right now. We'll probably have another four at least by the end of the year, potentially another six. So our goal is to have eight to 10 buildings coming out of the ground by the end of the year. Timeline. So this phase one, we really started last year. It took quite a bit um, to assemble the team. The unique thing about SVP is essentially no one's really been there before 2016. So we had to hire everyone. We're developing this all in house. Um, we don't have partners, outside developers working with us. We've gone out and tried to bring in the best talent to execute on these different buildings. Talk a little, we'll get to the. Um, Tampa, if you're not in Tampa now, you're probably missing out. There's a lot going on in Tampa. Most people don't understand how great it is. I'm born and raised in Florida, worked on some properties and, and projects in and around Tampa, and I honestly didn't understand how great it was until I moved there. It is a phenomenal lifestyle. There's a lot of people go, uh, moving there every day. Um, number one city for first time home buyers, eighth fastest growing city in the nation right now. This is what Water Street is. So what you see on the screen right now is a, a rendering at full build out. Um, we essentially, the, the um, Marriott Waterside is on the left, the hotel. That's built today. The arena in the middle is there and virtually nothing else that you see there is there today. It's a lot of surface parking lots and now active development sites. Um, we're building the core. We think we need to have a sense of place and a mass and a scale so people can move here, live here, and work here and not feel like they're in a perpetual construction zone. So we gotta build a lot at one time. This is a rendering of Water Street. So essentially, we're at corner of Water Street and Channel Side looking north, and this is what we envision the community, our district to look like when it's built out. We have larger setbacks than required. Our goal is really the next slide. The title says it all. We are building a vibrant urban environment, very street friendly, very pedestrian friendly, and a true place where people want to live and work. We're not doing an LA Live, we're not doing an entertainment zone, that's part of what we're doing in the district, but this is what we envision this being a real mixed use community. It's also, we're fortunate enough to work with Well, um, US, uh, the US GBC. We are, Tampa Water Street is the first well certified district in the world. We work with them to write the code um, and the requirements. We're very excited about this, as Sid talked about with Babcock. Um, we really truly believe in wellness. Here's some of the buildings. So we'll go through, um, this is our, our residential buildings. One thing also, um, our partners, our, our owners and our board they, um, our goal is to build and hold. So all this is pretty much multifamily rental. We're not doing many condos. First phase, we have only 36 condos in the entire five million square feet. Um, building on the left, two towers on a common podium with a grocer in the ground floor, 815 Water Street. We're coming out of the ground with that today. It will basically deliver at the end of 2020 uh, and be fully, we think fully CO'd by 20, you know, for second quarter of 2021. 20, um, we're lucky enough to host the Super Bowl in February of 21. So um, we'll have a few people in town and we can show off some of these buildings. Uh, the middle one, uh, 1077 Water Street, another residential tower, um, almost 400 residencies, residents, sorry. And then on the right, we have 1010 Water Street. These are all on Water Street. We think it's, an, it's important to have residents here living, shopping every day. Some of the offices, so there hasn't been a new office tower built in downtown Tampa in over 25 years. Um, on the right is Sparkman Wharf. Some of you probably know that as a former Channelside Bay Plaza. Um, we're totally redeveloping it. We tore down about 50,000 square feet, opened it up to the water, put in a new park, 
um, in green space. It's over an acre. I have some slides at the end on that, but it's now become one of the top waterfront destinations in, in, in Tampa. A um, lot of young families, a lot of empty nesters. It's just been incredible. We're reskinning the building right now, um, all new facade. There was a IMAX theater on the second floor. Most people in Florida know that second floor retail doesn't quite work in Florida. So we gutted the theater. We're putting in uh, brand new loft office spaces. We're moving back our headquarters into Sparkman um, at the end of this year. So we converted basically a totally dark, vacant theater into some of the best new office in downtown Tampa. It has water views, overlooks the park at Sparkman Wharf. It's the demand and the interest we've seen here is super strong. Um, ground floor retail throughout. So it's basically, we took an old entertainment center. Um, we're doing retail and food and beverage on the ground floor and then office throughout the entire second floor. <clears throat> Let's jump to the left, 1001. Um, this will be the first office, new office building to come out of the ground. It's at the hard corner of Channel Side and Water Street. Um, it's right next to the USF Med School. Um, Cook Fox is the architect on this. Um, we're pre-leasing this now and uh, very excited about this. We'll start construction on this in the next three months. Um, the building in the middle is our largest office tower. 400 channel side, it's right in front of the arena. We uh, think this is kind of your traditional CBD type office user. Um, we are pre-leasing this as well and probably start construction on this um, at the end of the year, beginning of next year, depending on where we are with leasing. Hotels, so we have uh, over 1,400 hotel rooms in the district. There's, right now, the Marriott is, uh, exists today, 727 Keys. It's been a tremendous asset. It anchors our, anchors our district on the waterfront. We have a marina there as well. The JW Marriott's coming out of the ground. Um, we're, the construction team is incredible. We're working with Coastal in Miami and our team, we're doing a floor a week at the JW right now. Um, then we're also, far left is the addition, Tampa, it's a joint venture between Marriott and Egan Schrager out of New York. It's the first, uh, you know, there's two in Miami, there's one in New York, and I think there's another one in West Hollywood they're building right now. This is a really great, we think this gives, this really fits with our brand and what we're trying to do. The hotel is on the, uh, is on the base of the building. The tower is actually the condo residences. So we have 36 planned there. It's the only condos in the entire district for first phase. Um, they are true condos, or it's not a condo hotel, but you get the hotel services um, if you, you can get all the concierge and all the hotel services as a resident as well. This is Sparkman. Um, it's really our only redevelopment. We, it's a great waterfront site right next to the port. Um, we decided, we went back and forth to tear this down and build new or to redevelop it. We ultimately redeveloped it. Um, as you can see in the middle, we basically put an outdoor beer garden where there was nothing before, tore down a building that was blocking the water. Um, and then we also brought in shipping containers. We have 10 shipping containers with some of the top restaurant tours in town. Um, Sid's right, it's a very tough business. They love working out of a container because the, mar the margins are a lot higher and they don't have to maintain all the uh, back of house that they normally would and, and really we've had some of these restaurateurs tell us they don't want to leave. Um, we use this really as a breeding um, and incubator for some of these restaurateurs and then we'll take them from here and move them into bigger spaces. So tried to stay on the five minutes there. <laughs> Happy to answer some questions. Um, so so Sid, you had mentioned that um, you wanted to make Babcock Ranch more like a town, right, as opposed to just like an insular development. So what did you model that on? What did you model that on? Did you have a town or a place in mind? You know, when you, when you look at uh, Florida, just, just in general, uh, it's, it's really known for its gated master plan communities. And uh, part of what comes of that are, is a lot of expense. And what you see is a lot of homeowners are frustrated when they come into these communities, uh, either you know, the, the cost of uh, HOA, POA, a lot of times there's clubs uh, uh, involved, and it just, it just makes it difficult uh, for people. So 
you know, for us, it was thinking about how do we create a real town? And, and as Tim will tell you, we had to think about that every time we had a discussion. It was, okay, this is a town, not, not a gated mass plan community, which we've done plenty of. It's a very different uh, mindset. But the idea was to be able to attract those kinds of people who weren't initially looking for, for a, a golf course community. We are building a golf course <laughs> in, in Babcock right now as we speak, so there ultimately will be one. But, uh, but there are plenty of options uh, for people. So y we have homes that are selling uh, just below 200,000 up to a million. I mean, literally the full stratification of pricing and products. So the idea of, of creating a town is something that I think here in Florida is, is, is sort of missing. And uh, there are a few that have done it very, very well here. Uh, and we wanted to, to kind of take that model and, and bring it to a whole nother level. By the way, uh, Tim did a phenomenal job for us uh, for the 10 years he was with us. Um, and, uh, and when he left, it was amazing how Babcock took off. So um, <laughs> there was no correlation between that at all. <laughs> So then, overnight success. Overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Tim, why did you, you know, decide to make the leap to Water Street, Tampa? What was about that vision that was so appealing to you? Um, really how unique the project is. I mean, um, Babcock and, and, and Kitson has phenomenal projects that I was able to work on. And, um, you, you know, I, I never thought I'd, I didn't think there's anything bigger than Babcock. I, I don't think there will be. Um, and you know, being able to develop not just one building, uh, you know, one or two, but a, a whole mixed use neighborhood and environment, it's a very unique deal. I mean, I, there's, there's, there wasn't a lot to model it after, much less, you know, in Florida, but even in the entire U.S., there's very few of these. So the challenge of, of really, you know, trying to build the team, um, one of the things Sid, you know, was huge on on my development was leadership, and so the challenge of trying to build a team that, that really, we didn't have a lot of folks when I got there. I was, you know, 20 something employees when I landed, we now have almost 60. So um, we've had to not only develop the buildings, but develop the team. And um, both those, you know, I wanted to see if I could be a part of it and help make it happen. Very cool. So has the vision evolved over time for either project? You know, uh, we, we, start, we started back in 2005. So I don't know if back in 2005, we had, I think, flip phones or, or Blackberries. Um, for you millennials, those are, don't have screens. They're just little, kind of like little typewriters. Um, but now, you know, it wasn't until like two years later uh, that the, uh, the uh, you know, smartphone came into place and, and then these tablets. So when we first started, uh, and we talked about technology and sustainability, there was kind of one view of that. And people actually didn't really understand uh, back in those days what it was about. So the, those, you know, those initiatives didn't change, but, but within those initiatives, they became more advanced and, and different as, as time went on. Uh, but we stayed very true uh, to, to, uh, to the original vision. Okay. Yeah, our vision um, has evolved. Um, it, 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 we, you know, have a street grid and a network in the downtown that we have to work within. So that was very defined. Um, we, we've moved some plans or, or some buildings around from, say, you know, block one to block two. Um, and a lot of the upfront, really, in the first year or so, was really just honing in the master plan for the community. Um, we're very excited about where we are today. Um, you know, there'll probably be some evolution of that as we go forward, but a lot of the, you know, the plan is set. Um, but with any of these developments, you have to um, roll with the punches sometimes, so you have to have some flexibility. It's also extraordinary what you guys are doing, though. Being able to come out of the ground and create that place in downtown Tampa from day one is, a, is, a, is just absolutely extraordinary. Well, Normally you have to very carefully phase your way through it. You have the ability to come up uh, all, almost all at once, and that's a very unique uh, proposition, especially for Tampa. Absolutely. I mean, it's part of what, what the draw was. It's also part of the, the challenge, and the, the most um, challenging aspect of it is just the scale. It'd be a lot easier to build, you know, one building at a time and just systematically roll through it, um, but we have to create a, a community and a sense of place, and 
Um, it is very unique. Um, we're very, very fortunate to be able to do that, and it's very uncommon. Um, but we want to deliver a, basically about a little more than half of the, the total development in the first phase. That's our goal. Um, and then we'll add on and kind of grow on the edges from there. That is, that is actually very remarkable. Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, I worked on a project in downtown Houston and it had the potential to really change part of the composition of the city. Yeah. And there was, um, we didn't even think about trying to phase it in that way or you know, to do it so quickly. It was very formulaic and it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so we dropped it, but um, it, my hat's off to you for that. So it's one thing to have a great vision, but it's another thing to execute. So I have to ask some questions about that. Um, so I guess my, my first question is about the team, right? How did you both get the right team in place and know who you know, were the external experts you needed to bring in? It is, I, I don't, everybody in this room will tell you the same thing. It's, it's about people and trying to find the right people and it is extremely difficult to do that. That's why if you're a UF you know, grad and you're going through this extraordinary program, you are gonna have a leg up on so many uh, people within this industry. I'm telling you, it's extraordinary what, what you have done uh, and, uh, and this program, uh, it's remarkable. And uh, so for us, finding the right people, uh, you know, you lose a Tim Johnson and it's, well, he wasn't so hard to replace, but. Um, <laughs> he didn't replace me, actually. <laughs> we, actually, you're right. <laughs> Uh, but you know, it, it is, it's extreme, it's just hard to find good people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so when you, when, you're, when you do find them, a lot, of, a lot of what we do is train them internally and, yep. and we've had a lot of people who start with us and end up being with us for quite a long time. Uh, but it's very, very hard uh, to uh, find that team. And then, uh, particularly because of some of what we're doing is somewhat unique, uh, that makes it challenging, and, and then finding uh, the professionals to help us uh, come in, and, and, I, and I would say one of, the, one of the bigger challenges is getting them to buy up on the vision. So when you sit down and you tell everybody you want to create this new town and, 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 and do some things that are uh, very unique with autonomous vehicles and, and new schools, and you know, we're just going to start with this school, and so w when you're sitting around a, a table and you, you kind of walk through this and they all look at you with a blank stare like, really? You know, you got to get buy-in from the internal group first and, and then uh, make sure the externally they do also. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I'm often asked what, what do I worry about and what keeps me up at night other than, you know, having a new baby on the way. Um, <laughs> it's team, honestly. It really is team. We've built a great team. Um, but the, let's be honest, the economy is, is, is humming right now. There's not a lot of people sitting on the sidelines and it's tough to hire the best and the brightest. We're fortunate, um, you know, our scale and the project um, attracts a lot of great people. But, you know, I worry about not only building the team and, and, and retaining them. It's one thing just to have them, you know, come on for a couple of years and then go somewhere else. Um, so I spend more time thinking about the team probably than anything. That's the thing that I'm most concerned about um, on a daily basis. Um, fortunately, we have great capital partners, so I don't have to worry about that as much. Um, but yeah, it, 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 not only internal team, but then an external team. I mean, we're, we're working with uh, a number of um, world-class architects, um, world-class construction firms, and those teams all have to work together. So coordinating that, um, you know, everyone knows, I think, you know, someone told me early in my career, development's like this, you know, equivalent of herding cats. Um, I think that's an understatement, especially when you're trying to build five million square feet. So um, you've got to work, you've got to have a great team, um, professionals that have to be very passionate. This is a lot of hard work. Um, and just every day you've got to get up and earn it, every day. So last night I was at a dinner with a bunch of the women in this room. And one of the things we were talking about was, you know, what qualities does somebody need to get into various parts of the industry? So. Um, what qualities would you look for, you know, to hire people on your team? I, I like, uh, personally, I look for people who are free thinkers, uh, who are willing to uh, challenge uh, what, we, what we're presenting. Uh, there's nothing worse than sitting around a table and having a bunch of, you know, people look at you and nod in their head, and when you know deep inside they want to sit there and go, you know, what an idiot. 
uh, well, not really, but, but it, it's that kind of a thing. You, 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 you want that, uh, look for a person who's not uh, afraid to speak up and, and be a part of the process and maybe come up with some of those big ideas. I totally agree with that. I would add um, two of the things that are high on my list are just a strong work ethic um, and a good attitude. Um, you know, when I joined Kitson, no, there wasn't, it's not like, you know, no offense, but it's not a lot of schooling to underwrite a 19,000, you know, yeah. a ranch. So you kind of <laughs> learn it and you got to figure it out. But you got to, you know, there's no schooling on how to develop 54 acres in a mixed use, you know, in, in town, urban environment either. So you got to have people that are just, I think, really strong work ethic mm -hmm. and a good attitude. And then we can teach, you know, I feel confident we can teach them yeah, a particular yeah. business. Okay. Um. Before we get to lessons learned, I'm curious about how you both engage with the local community. You know, obviously we all know what happened with Amazon HQ2, putting aside the subsidy issue. You know, some would say, probably a lot of people would say they didn't engage very well with the local community right there in Long Island City. Clearly, you both are having success. You must have done that well. What did you do? Well, that was the key to our success. Uh, being able to get this approved in uh, Southwest Florida, and particularly, you know, in, air, in a place that uh, was not uh, happy about growth. Um, but the first thing we did was we brought in the environmental community. We we met with them first uh, and talked it through. They, they created a consortium and uh, literally worked it through with them, and they turned out to be our greatest allies and really helped us through the entire process. And then we had a, a charrette process uh, where we brought in people from all over the, the uh, community who had a hand in, uh, and we filmed it all too, by the way. Uh, they had a hand in, in voicing their opinions. We had groups that were, were opposed to us. And what we would do is we make it easy for them. If they wanted documents, we put it online for them. Uh, we welcomed them, them in. We were not able to satisfy them, but at least they knew that we were gonna communicate and be as transparent as, as humanly possible. And that really took us a long way. And then getting in front of the messaging, we didn't want uh, the, the papers or others to dictate that message. So we spent the time really getting in front of that and uh, being proactive on the messaging. We, you know, you, you gotta play offense here. Um, and so we, we embrace the local community. Um, we deal with both the city um, and the county and other partners as well. But, you know, look, we're, we're, we're trying to um, contribute in a very positive manner to the community. So a lot of people are excited about what we're doing. I can't tell you it's a, you know, 100% favor, you know, fa not everyone's in favor. There's always people that don't want to see new development. But we're proud of what we're doing. We think it's, um, we think it's going to be a big part of Tampa. Um, you know, we, we all live in, in every, you know, we live in Tampa. There's, we're not coming from another market. We all moved and lived and live in Tampa to make this happen. So, you know, when we finish, we, we, we plan to stay there. Um, and we want to be proud of that. Uh, we want the community to, uh, to embrace it. And, you know, so we've been active from day one. Um, and you have to actively engage them and, and bring them in and have them be a part of the process. That makes sense. So switching gears then to lessons learned. Uh, I guess my I don't know if we have enough time. No, we don't have <laughs> enough time for that. <laughs> so I, I, I could write a book on mistakes and uh, you know paying that dumb tax. If anybody wants it, I'm happy to share it with you. But uh, you know, well, one of the things I think that uh, that the two things. One is um, how hard innovation is, and when you have a big idea and you think, wow, why wouldn't everybody want solar? Well, guess what? There's a whole group of people that don't want solar. And uh, it, was, it was shocking to me to learn that uh, even though you thought it was the right thing to do, which clearly seemed to be the right thing to do, others didn't, didn't, did not agree with that. So whether it be autonomous vehicles, whether it be a renewable energy, uh, whether it be uh, public charter schools, innovation is extremely difficult. You gotta have thick skin and you gotta be willing to stand up to it or nothing is gonna get done because a lot of people don't want you to move forward uh, with big ideas and, and certainly with innovation. There's always ulterior motives uh, as far as uh, that's concerned. So the people that didn't want solar, was it an excuse because they just really didn't want you to develop anything or did they really have a different point of view? No, it, there are groups that uh, think that, uh, you know, petroleum is a, is a, is a sacred cow and, and, and just to start that bull rolling uh, on 
on okay. renewables is uh, it, it, they want to delay as long as possible. And uh, we're, we, we're not government subsidized on anything at, at Babcock. So, and a lot of these other groups are, so there's some hypocrisy. Uh, I'm not going to get into that right now, but that's, uh, that's another, another round. Um, uh, look, I, I believe you learn from trying and failing. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of lessons learned. Um, I was fortunate, again, uh, there was a lot of lessons I learned with Sid and Kitson um, along the way. But I would say the biggest thing is we're always wrong. We always underestimate everything, time, um, people, how many people it takes to, to do something, um, and oftentimes, you know, the amount of capital that's needed. Um, you know, you try to get better every day and sharpen your pencil, but, uh, you know, I try to tell people to work with, and Sid's heard this, you know, we spend a lot of time modeling stuff, and I say, as soon as it comes off the printer, it's wrong. So, <laughs> you know, but you, you got to use it as a guide and, and go with it and, and try to plan that in the best you can and plan for contingencies and, and understand that it's going to take more of everything that, across the board of what you thought it would. So how does that process work internally if, if you know you need to make a change to your capital assumptions or, or timing? Transparency and honesty. I mean, you know, you, we, we underwrite everything individually and then also holistically. So we're building a community, so you have to look at it as that. It's a large, it's a portfolio of assets. Um, you know, we have flexibility where um, we ultimately are, you know, the focus is the portfolio, but we, ulti we also judge each individual asset individually as well. Um, so we, we start from the ground up and underwrite every asset, underwrite everything we're doing, um, and, and then roll that into a larger, if you would, a model. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what we budget off of, what we plan off of, what we communicate to our partners on. And then, look, you have to, you have, to have good partners. Um, Everyone in this business knows um, things change. Um, projects go, go late, um, you know, sometimes over budget, which you try to mitigate, but you gotta you know, monitor everything on a daily basis and, and communicate um, up and downstream. Fair. Um, what is something that surprised you, um, you know, from a positive standpoint? that you hadn't thought would happen? You know, I, I, we talk a lot about uh, approvals and, and dealing with government. I, I would say, I don't know if many of you have experienced this, but uh, we were surprised at how passionate uh, many of the government, uh, believe it or not, bureaucrats that we dealt with along the way, uh, how they wanted to, act, get, to be a part of it and get it done. In many cases, we felt a partnership uh, with many of the of, uh, of the government uh, officials, and uh, that that actually was uh, very surprising, uh, and, it, and it felt pretty good because rather than just saying no, no, uh, a lot of them were saying, how, "How can we get this done, or how can we work together?" Uh, so I, I, I was surprised to find that there were there were more people, more government officials, uh, that were had a had a positive attitude about what we we're trying to do rather than a negative uh, one. Um, yeah, I, I would say uh, just how excited everyone is about what, what, what we're doing. Um, I thought I came from a firm that was very high profile and doing a very high profile uh, project. I was totally wrong. I mean, Water Street Tampa and SVP is, is unbelievably under a microscope and everyone's not trying to knock us down. Um, it's, everyone wants to know what we're doing and they're so excited about it. Um, and, and that's, that's humbling. Um, you know, sometimes you just want to do your project and fly under the radar, and this one is definitely not a fly under the radar project. And, like, do people come up to you sometimes, you know, at kids, like, baseball games, you want to give them your own opinion? Well, luckily right now, the Lightning are, are the, the hottest ticket in town, so people usually go to the, you know, Lightning okay. players, and, and so we're not that level of status. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's great. I got to speak with some students yesterday, and you know, um, you know, people reach out, um, just want to learn what's going on, not only in the community but also, you know, in the in the broader real estate community. So, um, you know, it's 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 we try not to. Uh, it's fun going to Sparkman Wharf, but you know, you also want to enjoy it and not think of it as a. Uh, a job on a Saturday afternoon where we're trying to have a beer and a sandwich at the beer garden. Um, yeah. But the, 
I don't know about, well, I do know about Sid. You, I, I live and sleep, you know, sleep and eat this business. So mm -hmm. I can't, you know, go to some, one of our projects and not figure out, hey, we could have done something better or we should have done it this way. And, and you take that and apply that to the next project. I get it. Okay. Well, I think we have time for some questions. So. What did we learn about patience? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any. That well, was, let's see. That was, a um, question. That was planted? Yeah. Um, we, so we are an overnight success. Um, we started in 06, <laughs> and uh, just perfect timing. We nailed it. Um, and then waited uh, 10 years before we actually got started. Um, it really pays to have patient capital. That's, sure. that's really the key uh, in, in making certain that uh, if we had started uh, the project, uh, before 06 and gotten into 07, I, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Uh, so the fact that we were able to be patient, uh, long-term patient capital, and then during the downturn, you know, very candidly, we worked on a lot of things that made the project a whole lot better. So during those downturns, and I know many of you room, uh, in this room know what we're talking about, we purchased some projects, other projects, and then we worked on Babcock and made it better. So uh, when we actually did get started, I think we were in a better position than if we had started back in, in 06. But patient capital, really important. Absolutely. Um, the one thing I've learned is you can never have enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have to balance that with a sense of urgency as well, though. And, and you have to, we're, look, we're playing long ball here, and you gotta take a long view. Um, we're, we make decisions today that we think will have a more meaningful impact in 10 to 15 years down the road. Um, I, I, we don't make decisions today um, for today. And so you, you have to understand um, the nature of the project and what you're doing and step back and, and understand that, you know, if you're doing these projects, it's, it's not just about get in and get out as quick as you can. So a lot of the decisions you make, um, you know, we're focused on the long run. Um. I guess one I'll add to that, you know, as I've been the equity behind some larger projects. My equity, my investor was a long-term investor. And what I found was when things were going wrong and we needed to extend the duration of a project, for, for me to articulate the why and what and how was gonna go happening going forward was really important. And as long as this investor felt like we were being a really good steward of his capital, he was willing to stay in, right? But the moment, that trust would have um, gone away, he probably would have pulled the plug. Anything else? You know, I, I, I really hope that the um, that the place that we have created uh, fulfills its promise. So, you know, we, we have uh, uh, Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi for people out, outdoors. And, and the whole idea is, is to get people outside and, and to kind of redirect the way that our youth is, is spending their time. We're not gonna get them off the computers, but I, I don't know, I'm dating myself when I was a kid. My mother would kick us out of the house and tell us to be home, you know, for dinner. We had no iPhones, no, you know, nothing. They didn't know where we were and that independence was great. We actually picked teams. We didn't have parents all over us. We picked our teams when we were playing a, a sport. And yeah, we'd get into a scrape, but it, we always worked it out. And so it's, it's kind of that, that feeling. We, we right now have uh, kids who are riding their bikes to school and walking to school, believe that it or not, and their parents aren't getting thrown in jail for doing it. Um, so you know, I hope we can create a safe place, a safe environment with the new technologies, and love to see the autonomous vehicle systems really take shape. But uh, a, a hometown, a true hometown, that uh, that's, has a safe environment, that's a healthy community, uh, and I'd love to see that 20 years from now when I go back, that be the result of, of what we've done. 
ditto. I mean, it's, it's all about place. Um, it is all about place on, on these longer, big projects. And we are trying to elevate Tampa and do our part to a, um, a more premier market and uh, a primary market. And frankly, um, myself, our, our owners, we're tired of seeing a lot of very talented young people go to some of the best universities in the state and then leave. And um, you know, for us, it's about retaining that talent here in Florida um, and then building around that, not only buildings, but companies and um, economics around that. And so you can't do it without, without the right, I mean, look, we've talked to a lot of office people, um, tenants, everyone, it's a talent war now. That's all it is. So it's all about recruiting the best, um, and, and so we want to have a place that attracts the best um, and, and, and elevate Tampa um, as well. And, and look, we're not going to do it on our own. We, we definitely think we're a catalyst of that. Um, but there's a lot of great things going on in other parts of Tampa that we're super excited to see. Great. I think we have. Sea level rising issues in your project. How are you considering those issues uh, as a big item for us? I'm with Marine Real Estate, and we're looking at everything on the coast and we, concern about that. We build up, um, literally. I mean, um, everything we have a resiliency plan in place. Um, all of our mechanicals are above 18 feet. Um, it's expensive, but um, we want to be. We want the buildings to be able to operate if they're. I mean, we're on the water. Um, God forbid a hurricane came into the bay. Um, we have a scare, um, but uh, you have to elevate everything, um, and that's what we do. So we've, we've planned for, for flooding um, and, 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 ele and elevation. Um, we're not going to solve sea, uh, you know, sea, the le sea level rise. Um, th I think there's a lot of more intelligent people working on that. It's definitely an issue. Um, but you know, we, we, we have a resiliency plan in place and it, it's factored into every one of our buildings and it costs more money. Probably have time for one more if there's anything. Um, what we're hoping is, is that the storage becomes more efficient and that we can literally become a, a microgrid city town. Uh, that would be the ultimate goal and approve. As we all know on, on, re on renewables, uh, storage is the holy grail. So we really want to see if we can pioneer that and we have a, so we have the infrastructure in place to prove it out. Uh, all of our uh, electricity, everything is underground. Um, so we, we have some resiliency to the winds and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, ideally, what I'm hoping that Florida Power and Light uh, can work towards is creating uh, that microgrid that I, I think could be transformational for us and for others into the future. It's, it's part of the solution. It's a long-term solution. We get that. But uh, you've got to start somewhere, and uh, we want to be at the forefront of that. Well, thank you very thank you. much. Appreciate it.